Multiple dimensions of inequity require system-level solutions, broad-based partnerships, and changes in social norms. This session will bring together leading experts and practitioners to unpack the multiple and interrelated sources of discrimination that people face and that inhibits progress across multiple SDGs. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Alice Allen, a senior advisor at Business Fights Property. I'm thrilled to be hosting this session today on how we try to build inclusion for all by working with business to put intersectionality into practice. As we're all aware, COVID-19 has highlighted stark inequalities across countries and within societies. But at the same time, we've seen some seismic movements calling for change, from Me Too to Black Lives Matter. So as we seek to rebuild better, how do we stop the pick and choose approach of tackling inequalities, be it gender or race, disability, sexuality, and rather have a strategy to examine and address multiple and overlapping or intersecting disadvantages. The business case for change is clear. More diverse companies simply are better companies. So as McKinsey has shown us in their latest report, uh, companies in the top quartile for gender diversity on their executive teams are 24%, uh, 25% more likely to be profitable. And for ethnic, ethnic diversity, top quartile companies are 36% more likely to outperform on profitability. Now, businesses have been playing their part for some time now, uh, implementing diversity in, and inclusion teams and strategies, ensuring more inclusive recruitment processes and delivering on a number of uh, corporate social responsibility initiatives. But we think it's time to end the hierarchy of social inequalities. And as someone who's worked on gender equality for many years, including on toolkits for business. I've had to take a good look at myself recently uh, and ask whether I've been um, intersectional enough in my thinking and my understanding, or whether by solely focusing on gender, I've simply uh, been sort of replacing the white patriarchy with a white matriarchy. Uh, after all, uh, black women are extremely poorly represented at executive and managerial levels across companies. So today, we're going to hear from some leading experts from a really great range of, of, of sectors on how business can take a more intersectional approach. And we're hopefully going to learn a little bit about some exciting examples from marketing strategies to diversity and inclusion initiatives to social action and much more. Each panelist is going to speak for three minutes and then I'm going to pose some questions. And it's a really deep and, and, and rich conversation and a very small amount of time. So we're all going to try our very best to, to keep to time and keep this as exciting and interesting as it is. So first of all, I'm going to go to our first speaker, uh, Dr. Jane Pillinger. Jane is a world renowned expert on gender equality, especially looking at issues of tackling violence and harassment in the workplace. So Jane, why does intersectionality matter? And have you seen any progress towards how companies are taking this approach when it comes to gender. Yeah, thank, thanks Alice. And it's, it's great to be talking about this issue. Um, and yes, in my work, I've seen quite a lot of progress and a lot of discussion in moving towards a better understanding of intersectionality and what an intersectional approach could mean on gender, but it's by far not enough. I um, mean, I was thinking back to, I remember when Kimberly Crenshaw first defined intersectionality 30 years ago. I mean, it was a groundbreaking moment. And she did this to ensure that feminism took account of oppression, multiple forms of discrimination. But it's, it's interesting because the issue has only really come into public discourse and in the world of work in the last decade. And today, and more and more companies are recognizing you know, the value of diversity and inclusion. They want to recruit and retain the best staff, the best talent, you know, they're recognizing discrimination faced by black women, LGBTI and so on. But how far really has the progress been made in, in addressing multiple and intersecting dis, dis, discrimination and intersectionality? I'm not so sure. Observing companies and their strategies is that it tends to be on a group by group basis. This year we'll do LGBTI, next year we'll do disability. However, I think we're in the middle of quite a significant change at the moment. 
it's a hugely important issue today in the light of, and I agree with you, um, Alice, about, you know, Me Too, Time's Up, the Black Lives Movement and other social movements are really looking, and indeed some of the challenges that we're facing in relation to COVID-19 and the increase in domestic violence and recognition of that, that, you know, more and more businesses are beginning to respond. But we need to take the next step. We need for businesses to be you know, perhaps representing themselves. I mean, in a, in a way, the issue is that businesses are part of important societal institutions that can forge change, take proactive roles, work in partnership, and do this not just because it'll help their competitiveness, but also because they have a wider social purpose and role in shaping a society that is fair, equal, and respectful of all. And I think that's where intersectionality comes in. Just to give a, a really quick uh, example, if we look at the gender pay gap, for example, you know, we can look at the gender pay gap across an organization, across a company, but unless we de dig deeper into the causes of the, the pay gap and look at, you know, what is the pay gap for mothers? What is the pay gap for black women, for women in lower paid, precarious or lower valued jobs? All of these issues are really important to really getting a better understanding of, of inequality. I work mainly in the area at the moment of gender-based violence, and it's absolutely essential that we address women's vulnerabilities and risks from an international in, intersectional perspective. And if we don't take account of intersectionality and the discrimination experienced, particularly by racialized workers, particularly women, then our strategies to end gender-based violence are going to fail. So ending, I mean, ending violence and harassment in the world of work needs also to be tied to ending discrimination. And that's why I think intersectionality can really help us because it can help us look at the social norms that reinforce and perpetuate it. This means recognizing that discrimination takes place across multiple grounds around race, sex, age, sexual orientation, gender diversity, migration background status. We know that some of the, the, the worst experiences of, of violence and harassment are from women who are in the most low paid and precarious jobs, domestic and care workers from migrant backgrounds, particularly vulnerable and so on. And we know from many, many studies that LGBTI workers, that the issues are, are for sexual harassment for younger women, women with disabilities are, are real problems. So when we take account of these risks and vulnerabilities using an intersection approach, I think it can really help us to look at how we can address these in our laws, in our business strategies, in our workplace policies and prevention programs. And I think offer us a real opportunity to really dig into the problems of, of, of discrimination and inequality. Thank you so much, Jane. I know there's masses to say. That's fantastic. Thank you ever so much. We'll come on to the opportunities again a bit later. Um, I'd like to now move on to hear from Sandra. So Sandra Kerr is a director of race at uh, Business in the Community, uh, a UK organisation that launched uh, the Race at Work Charter, um, which I think has 400 signatories now, and amongst other things, calls for an ethnicity pay gap reporting. So Sandra, tell us more about that and over to you. Thank you. So um, I think the, the big issues um, that obviously the, the virus has highlighted, the disproportionate impact, first of all, on ethnic minority communities, so Black and Asian people who are overrepresented in some of the key workers, frontline services, transport, um, and cities that had to continue to operate even when uh, other workers could actually start to work at home. And then also it spotlighted um, the impact of them being more likely to be on some of the lower paid uh, scale, pay scales, which meant also more likely to be in rented accommodation, cramped housing, social distancing. All of the, those things became a challenge and that I think has contributed to some of the disproportionate volumes of um, contagion uh, from the virus. Uh, you set out at, at the outset, we know about the McKinsey study about the 36% actually better financial returns for more ethnicity at senior levels. But we also know that it's actually uh, worth in the UK, 
our government has sponsored a, re a review, we know it's actually worth 24 billion per annum to the UK to tackle all the different racial disparities across the labour market. And if you think about, you know, economic downturns and challenges, it has to be in the advantage of any government or any society to actually make that recovery as easy as possible so that you can tap into the um, benefits for all of us um, in, that would be gained by doing this. Um, it's also spotlighted, so more likely uh, to be in unstable work, fixed term contracts, zero out contracts. Um, and what we know from the last economic downturn in 2008, in 2010, which is two years later, 60% of Black and Asian people have no savings at all. So there is a, all of the things that I've kind of talked about create a, a lack of res financial resilience when shocks like this come into play. Yeah. And we also know from data from um, our government as far as, you know, on a website, Ethnicity Facts and Figures website, where they've put the data and insight in the public domain. In 2014, 29% of black women would report a common mental health disorder. So anxiety, depression, stress, and then if you think about, I know there's never been a big campaign to tackle mental health um, in women or ethnic minority women. So then you think about the pandemic and the disproportionate um, volume of death, contagion, and then the Black Lives Matter, you know, traumas. Then you realize that there is a, an issue around mental health that I think we definitely need to be looking at. And we've been encouraging employers to actually, you know, make sure for as a at least basic self staff that managers are checking in with their employees, that they look at training people on mental health first aid internally, who can be, you know, spaces for people to talk about um, these issues. So that becomes really, really important. And when we saw the Black Lives Matter uh, kind of challenges, the, the, the kind of the peaceful protests um, all around the world, we called on leaders, organizations to think about leadership. So how can they ensure voice? So at the top table, how do you know that when you are making decisions that are going to impact people from uh, different backgrounds and particular intersectionality with social uh, backgrounds where they have those connections to be at that top table, how are you going to ensure you hear their voice so you can take those voices on board for decisions that will impact them? The second area we called for action was around allyship. So we saw white and black people peacefully kind of demonstrating to say we need change. So how do you mobilize that voice and encourage those who want to stand up to actually speak up and be that voice where people, are, um, different pe voices of um, ethnic minority people are not present. And then the third area was encouraging employers to really listen to employers, their employees active listen and also recognize that those employees can help them connect to the communities who are often right behind the queue when it comes down to voluntary action, investment, and maybe supporting of enterprise. So I will stop there as some of the challenges um, that I'm setting up. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Sandra. Some interesting ones we can come back to definitely around allyship. Um, Zubair, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. So Zubair Junjunia is a One Young World ambassador. Uh, and when he was 16 years old, founded Z Notes, which is a community led learning platform that is on a mission to end educational inequality and has reached millions of students globally. So Zubair, can you say a little bit about the role of technology and its potential to enhance equality? Absolutely. Thanks, Alice. Um, the fact that I'm standing and sitting, well, sitting here and speaking to you today is um, testament to the fact that uh, a 16 year old blog turned into a global phenomena and reached, you know, first thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of people around the world. Um, and technology has provided this incredible solution for us for scalability. Firstly, the fact that these whatever idea, whatever resource you create can now reach, you know, hundreds of thousands of people without, with a click of a button. Um, and with the internet, the fact that there's, an, there's a reach that's just profound, you know, we could never think about uh, these kind of numbers um, 
you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, when um, our circles of communications were so limited to those who were around us, those who lived close by to us, and for some of us, the ability to travel and, and meet others. Um, so the technology is a great enabler for enhancing equality, but I think there are two very key components, um, an example for which um, Zenotes is, that actually can that actually re relates to how equality can actually be taken place. So one of them is the mission, um, and as you said, ours is about ending education inequality. Um, if you have a solution which is you know on a mission to enhance equality, it needs to be front, right, and center. It needs to be part of the way the the, the organization works. It's about um, how the people behave on that platform. How how every next feature that's developed for that that solution is, is thought about because it has to relate to that mission. And number two is community. And I say community and not team because um, a team is incredible, right? They're the people who, who are building, who, who are like spending their days and nights thinking about what's the best way to improve the solution. But a team can only be, you know, 50 people, 100 people, 1,000 people if you're huge. Um, but a community is what makes a solution live forever. It is people who believe in your mission, who believe in your solution, and who believe that what you've created can actually impact, you know, those around them. Um, so with us, you know, I, I founded it as a 16 year old, but the fact that I'm talking still about it, um, and I've, I'm still developing and building it and, and finding new and more people to kind of get involved on this project with, is because of the community, because students from all over the world contributed, added to that platform and grew it. Um, but while I'm on this topic, um, you know, technology is incredible and, and uh, it, it, it can really solve so many issues for us. Um, I do want to remind us that today we're speaking and being able to see each other. Um, many of us are listening from our homes, but we are privileged to do so. We are sitting in front of a computer. We're sitting in front of a, an awesome internet connection to be able to stream live to you. Um, and this is a privilege. And we must not forget that there are millions out there who do not have this. So we must think about solutions that involve technology to enhance equality, but we must remind ourselves that we don't exasperate this inequality by forgetting those who do not have access. That's me. Great, thanks ever so much, Savir. Yes, access. Okay, fantastic. Um, I'm gonna move us on now to hear from David Grayson. So David is a leading, world leading academic on corporate social responsibility uh, and formerly chaired a National Disability Council in the UK. And he's also chair of Carers UK. Um, so, David, can you tell us a little bit more about how fundamental support for caring is to enable greater equality? Definitely great to be hearing about this systemic issue. Alice, absolutely. You very noticeably didn't include unpaid carers, caregivers in your introduction. And I think part of a, a rounded discussion of intersectionality needs to start from an inclusive perspective of the different groups we're talking about. And I think all too often, in these kinds of discussions, we forget the hundreds of millions of people across the world who at any one time are caring unpaid for a family member or a friend who needs their help because, for example, they have a physical or, or, or mental uh, disability, they have uh, uh, some long-term health condition, perhaps um, they're simply growing older and more frail and, and, and need help. And of course, many, many of those people who are unpaid carers um, are people who are also juggling their job and caring for their loved one. We reckon uh, in the UK, that's something now like around one in seven of the average workplace will be juggling their job and caring for a loved one. In places like um, Australia, little bit uh, uh, less, one in eight. Canada, we think possibly one in three and, and so on. So I think, and we also know, by the way, that during the, the COVID crisis, certainly at least here in the, uh, the UK, that the numbers of unpaid caregivers has massively increased. There were just over 9 million carers before the pandemic started. That's increased by 50% during the lockdown as paid care workers have had to stop going to people's homes, respite care, daycare centres and so on have all had to be closed. 
So this is a really significant issue. We're possibly talking as many as 700 million people across the world, maybe 300 million juggling job and caring for a loved one. And I think there's some very practical things that a good employer can do as an integral part of a more comprehensive approach to diversity and inclusion. Because the majority of those unpaid caregivers will be women. Uh, many of them um, will themselves um, have their own health issues, particularly um, amongst older carers. And we know, for instance, and Sandra was just commenting on the importance of tackling mental health uh, more urgently. We know, certainly from our state of caring research in, in the UK, something like 80% of long-term carers feel isolated and social isolation then, of course, becomes a harbinger of, 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 of depression and mental ill health. The practical things that, that, that employers can do is, first of all, understand who are their working carers asking as part of an annual employee survey for example looking at every policy that they have for their people and thinking about how do we care a proof it that may be flexible working we've seen this incredible phenomenon across the world of working from home with many organizations saying that you can continue to work from home indefinitely into the future at least for part of your working week. How do we capitalize on that to help people who are also caring for a, a loved one? I think just as many good organizations have employee networks for employees who are LGBT plus or who are disabled employees and so on, so good employers have networks uh, for their working carers. One of the crucial things and a real early win that uh, is available for, for any employer is to get much better at cross-fertilizing the learning between their different employee networks. But above all, I want to make the case, not just on, on behalf of Carers UK, we're part of a European-wide network of, of Euro carers, part of also of a, a IARCO, an international alliance of care organizations. I want to make the case that we need to think carers in a much more integrated approach to intersectionality. Mm, super. Thanks so much, David. And I think there's also a fascinating discussion to be had about the opportunity of, of building and encouraging governments to develop a caring economy as well. OK, super. Um, I'm going to move us on now to Jody. Uh, Jody Harris is a Global Vice President of Marketing, Culture and Capabilities, which I think is a fascinating title in itself and would love to know more about, at AB InBev, um, which is the world's largest brewing company. Um, and I know from some work with ABI that they've done some great work on busting gender stereotypes through some of their brands in South Africa. And have also got some really interesting diversity and inclusion policies. So Jody, can you tell us a little bit more about how the company is pulling some of this work together. Sure, absolutely. And um, first of all, thank you for having me on behalf of ABM Bev, um, but also thank you for bringing visibility to this very important topic. It's, it's a challenge for every business, for sure. Um, and personally, for me, um, I am a woman, but not all women are the same, as we know. Um, um, I have a Jewish husband, and I'm bringing up two children in an interfaith family. And um, not to mention juggling career <laughs> and caretaking as well. So thank you for that, David. Um, so intersectionality is a very important topic. Um, and AB InBev, as you know, is, is the world's leading brewer and CPG company. We have over 170,000 colleagues around the world in over 100 countries. Um, and our purpose as a company is, is to bring people together for, for a better world. And beer has for centuries been, been doing that. Um, but unfortunately, the industries that we operate in, both beer as well as advertising, um, have been historically oriented toward traditional portrayals of, of men and masculinity, uh, predominantly white men. And even though women uh, purchase 75% of beer that's sold globally um, and over 30% of all beer consumed uh, with women worldwide. Um, and also research, there's recent research that has just been published in the advertising industry uh, that shows that commercials and digital videos are more likely to have male characters um, who have more screen time, who have more speaking time than women, and it's far, far worse with women of color. Yet we know that when you portray 
uh, women in an accurate, positive light. Um, progress is made, purchases are, are made, um, and brand love increases as well. And, and as marketers, um, we have a tremendous responsibility. Right? We are, we're the champions of consumers and customers inside of our organizations. And as marketers, we're also the caretakers of our brands. And so we have to start with the inside um, and to use our most important tool, which is our voice. Um, our marketing team, our composition, and this is the first point I'd like to make, it's, it's really shifted over the past few years. Um, globally, we're now 50-50 men-women ratio, including our senior leadership. Um, and it's actually helped us to bring you know, greater capabilities, greater voice, greater perspective from data scientists, product developers, creative directors, who really helped us to understand um, different aspects of, of women um, and building empathy so that you know, our, our products, our brands um, you know, uh, can, can better reflect and relate. Uh, with women. So it becomes personal as well. Um, but it doesn't stop there, right? This is a story of evolution. Uh, we need to reflect a more diverse and ever-changing uh, environment as our consumers and our communities continue to, to evolve as well beyond gender. Um, and it's also about getting better, right? It's, it's by investing, really. It's, it's in the resources, it's in the partnerships that help us to continuously learn and make progress. Um, so for example, we've elevated our center of, of creative excellence. Um, we've embedded DNI into the development and execution processes of all of our creative work. This includes our research methodologies. This includes diversity on our creative councils as well as our advisories. Um, this is biased training for everyone in our organization. Um, and it's even rewarding people behind um, some of the brave work and campaigns um, that are championing DNI. We have an internal creative festival that we, all, we call Creative X. And that really drives momentum um, and recognition of people really driving the change. And then in fact, some of this brave work um, has helped us to bring about significant visibility uh, for women. Um, and in sports, as an example, through our partnerships with the National Women's Soccer League, um, as well as media allocation resources to promote women's football viewership um, during prime time in our Argentina market. Um, and then lastly, for, from a partnership perspective, um, for two years now, we've, we've been an advisory member with the um, Association of National Advertisers, hashtag SeeHer. Um, and it's providing us with education. It's providing us with data via their gender equality measurement um, testing, as well as tools to help us, as well as our creative partners to evolve. Okay. That's fantastic. Thanks so much for that overview of how the whole company is starting to take these issues seriously from all the different angles. Um, our final speaker is Maria Noel Baiza, uh, who is Regional Director of the Americas and Caribbean uh, and former Head of Programs at UN Women HQ. Maria, can you tell us a little bit about how intersectional feminism can be a driving force to helping companies play a role in achieving the SDGs and how UN Women can help with this? Thank you very much for having us and also for this amazing question that for us is, is fundamental because we are trying to uh, work very, very closely with the private sector, particularly in my region, we have an amazing program that is called Win Win uh, in, uh, because we want to uh, bring the awareness by having inclusion of women of all genders, of all um, races, because don't forget that in my region, we have 30 million of women that are indigenous of different ethnias. And we have 125 million of Afro-descendant women. And normally, if we talk about, for example, pay gap in our region, in, in the, the white women, if you want, we don't have white women <laughs> really per se, because we're all intersected with indigenous, Afro-descendant, mestizos, what we call. Uh, but um, we have a different pay gap for Afro-descendants and indigenous that we have for women that have access to, to this education. Mm -hmm. So let me say that there are, like, I would say uh, five points that I would like to make. The first one is uh, how do we continue pushing for integrating policies in the private sector? And for that, we are using as a vehicle, the seven principles of women economic empowerment uh, where when you sign that, we provide a set of uh, advice. Uh, we have a, a, a tool that is uh, free for the companies. So the companies can see themselves how they are. 
in terms of intersectionality, in terms of inclusiveness of women. So the way to try to eliminate, uh, you know, the discriminations uh, on intersectionalities of women is by generating these new policies, by generating networks, by making sure that the leaders of the companies are aware that they need to change their mentality, not because it's only a human rights issue, but because it's a good business. And that's why we call it will win-win, because you win in terms of being inclusive uh, uh, with, uh, with other parts of the society, but you also win by carving a niche of your company, particularly to appeal in the millennium um, consumers that they are much more conscious of what they are buying on, in terms of products and services. And also uh, generating this collaborative uh, ambiance environment in the, in, the, in the company. And we are seeing it, I just came from, uh, I was in, in, in Chile virtually <laughs> in, a, in a very interesting uh, discussion with more than 500 people on the energy sector, energy and mining sector, where women are only 20%. And what we are seeing is a move, it's a change, because when women are acting in the mining sector, when they are given their opportunity, the, the company increases productivity. Women are much more care, careful uh, handling uh, the high, the, the high uh, machinery. Uh, women are much more careful in terms of handling um, you know, all the processes. So that immediately becomes aware to the uh, managers that provide opportunity that women have a different way of doing things. So by being inclusive, they're gaining. Mm -hmm. um, and for so, us, uh, the intersectionality the, the is not only race, it's ethnia, but it's also disability, um, as, as Jody has uh, mentioned. Uh, we have uh, enormous programs, uh, progress in Argentina and Brazil in this respect, because you know, we have more than 20% uh, of the population in Latin America has disability. And I'm afraid that with the pandemic, we will have much more uh, disabilities in terms of mental health. Uh, we are seeing it, that this is affecting a lot of women, not only with violence against women that has been uh, ramping in my region, unfortunately, but also because this is something that is here to, to stay. We don't know when we're going to be <laughs> out, right? So in a nutshell, uh, we believe very strongly that it's a win-win process that we need to continue demonstrating in all the sectors, not only the traditional sectors where women are, you know, tourists, restoration, services of, you know, uh, um, uh, hospitality, etc., but also in the hard uh, sectors of the economy, like a uh, hard industry. Brilliant. So I'm happy to continue, but I know that you will close me. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Marina. Well, okay, we're going to go on to some questions. I know everyone will be bursting to want to talk to each other, let alone everyone else out there want to ask you questions. But um, I wondered, I'm going to go to um, David, Zubair, and Jody to ask you if, in a, a word or a sentence, um, you could uh, illustrate what you think the biggest challenges are to achieving a more intersectional approach in the workplace. Is it language? Is it leadership? Is it culture? David, can I go to you first? I thought we were going to be unmuted automatically, but there we but, go. Right. So <laughs> I think the really uh, important issue is around the culture of the organization because all too often we have organizations as you said uh, Alice much earlier there is this this year we'll do disability next year we will do um, LGBT plus etc um, what is really important is an organization that is committed to creating an inclusive and engaging and empowering culture which therefore sees each individual employee as an individual with a whole set of different issues. And in order to create that kind of culture and to sustain it, requires, of course, tone from the top and tone from above as well. So particularly line managers and particularly line management training. 
Perfect. So perfect. That's perfect. Really no more. <laughs> that's perfect. I think that's that's a great illustration of culture as a potentially a barrier, but is the, the big opportunity as well if we can shift the culture of an organization. Zubair, can I come to you? What do you yeah, think about um, barriers? Well, David's uh, stolen my thunder because I was going to go with culture as well. Um, but it, it's it's absolutely just resonating with what David just said. It's about building the kind of the morals, the values, the systems of belief that your company, your entity is is, is shaped around. And I mentioned mission right at the start. Um, if your mission is, is, is driven to those social goals, you know, we've talked about the SDGs in this conversation right now. Um, if you're directly linked to thinking about how can you make this world a better place, how can we create a so positive social impact around us? I think it's just, you know, it's obviously going to happen that you're going to create a culture of people who are going to be obviously thinking about diversity and inclusion. Brilliant. So purpose, company's purpose is a big opportunity. Jody, as a company that's been doing this, what have been some of the challenges you face? I would say, you know, the biggest barrier, and it's, it's probably not only us, um, is that DNI or let's talk DNI total, right? Um, has been seen as a special project, mm. right? And many companies, uh, we don't, but many companies out there um, treat it as a one size fits all solution where, mm. you know, quotas could fulfill that, that gap in the short term. But that flies in the face of what intersectionality is really all about. And, um, you know, I think it, it takes commitment, it takes investment, it takes hard work. And it takes time. These things don't change, you know, the, it doesn't change overnight. And just to echo one of the points that was made earlier, it's about investing in your leadership and your people, right? Um, especially as <clears throat> you start to create uh, more of a balanced uh, leadership group. Um, we've, we've hired um, Arielli and company, uh, a, sp a specialist executive development firm to really focus in on women's leadership and development that's personalized uh, to each individual. So it's not just a one size fits all. Super. That's another reference to no one size fits all, which I think absolutely sums up this agenda. OK, coming on to the opportunities. So I was going to go to Jane and Sandra and Maria Noel to give us some examples or inspiration uh, that you've heard about where you think the big opportunities are to make improvements. Um, yeah, I mean, there's lots of examples. There's lots of fantastic examples coming from the business sector, from the community sector, from workers themselves. And I. I maybe just like to give one example and I, I want to come back to the issue of violence and harassment at work because it's you know I'm passionate about ending it and passionate about ending a gender-based approach and taking an intersectional approach to that and there's a number of companies AB InBev is one of them um, also Vodafone and a few other companies that are now introducing global policies on ending domestic violence you know, they're saying no to domestic violence and they're doing really, really good work in establishing policies that support their employees who are experiencing domestic violence, helping them to stay in their work, their work, giving them, for example, Vodafone took the lead on this first, Sabi and Bev and other companies have also done the same to give 10 days paid domestic violence leave to help with restructuring of your work, helping with you know, in some cases, some companies are helping with giving loans and financial support because we know that financial abuse is one of the big issues that some women face. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you take an international intersectional perspective and you look at the barriers and difficulties for women in leaving violent partners, often it's women from migrant backgrounds, women who have been, you know, I suppose, controlled and their finances controlled and who don't have an independent income find it very, very difficult to leave. So the company programs that are being developed are really inspiring. They're backed by UN Women. It's in the new ILO Convention on Violence and Harassment at Work. And I just want to say a quick word about this because, and I was an expert to the ILO in the development of this new convention. And for me, it's groundbreaking because it not only... Um, promotes a gender-based approach, but it uh, promotes a, an approach to dealing with violence and harassment in the world of work for all workers, you know, whether they're informal workers, whether they're in paid and salaried work, but also takes into account domestic violence and the impact of domestic violence at work. So I think, you know, this is a great opportunity. It was voted for by thousands and thousands of employers and workers and governments across the world in the International Labour Conference. And there's great support now for ratification. Brilliant. Jane, I'm going to have to stop. 
stop you there, but thank you so much. And yes, everybody should read the convention, C190. Um, Sandra. Um, what I've seen, so we have seen uh, 170, more than 170 employers signing up to the Race at Work Charter in recent weeks. And that's about commitment to continue, not just an initiative, but to really drive forward change, leadership through to progressing talent in the workplace. So that's a, a key area. I, I commend every employer. We have some employers who have voluntarily published their ethnicity pay gaps, not waiting on legislation, wanting to be as transparent as possible. And I think that will tackle, at least put a spotlight on some of the issues we've already talked about there. We're seeing more and more employers wanting now to look at allyship movements, I would say, rather than program, trying to move this, not just a one-off, oh, let's sign up, but let's continue to speak up and make change across the board. Um, setting targets, recognizing need to look at demographic data. How can we ensure that actually the, the changes that are implemented when we look at it one year on, two year on, there's real progress. And then finally, I think supply chains are really looking at enterprise as well. How can they ensure inclusion there, be it with women, people from um, different backgrounds who are setting up enterprises, how they can include them in supply chains, mm. as well, that recovery. Super, thanks so much. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned that. That's a great, uh, a great example. Um, Maria Noel. Thank you. Um, let, me, let me say uh, four things. Uh, for me, the most important uh, opportunity is the changing of the mindset of the leader towards an organizational culture and organizational responsibility towards inclusion. So the more you guys in Europe and the US push the international companies to do that, the more we trickle down to the different countries in my region at least uh, to mirror that because they will see that that's the way to go, right? So it is very, very important to keep this leadership very much engaged and in this change on, of organizational culture. Then uh, for us, it's extremely important to dismantle an equal corporate culture. And, and to dismantle that, we have to tackle uh, stereotypes, the status quo that associate with uh, an identity to be a leader. We have to tackle that. And also to adopt a long-term holistic approach to addressing all forms of discrimination, because it's not only women as we were talking on, on uh, intersectionality. Also, the opportunity is the technology gap. We, as um, uh, Subai said, there are so many people that haven't reached uh, computers, that haven't reached the world of Zoom. So we need to work harder to remove completely this gap that exists of women accessing uh, you know, technology. So we have this brilliant opportunity to try to do that. So hopefully we, we can be together with the private sector because the more the poor people reach technology, the more they're gonna be in the market. So it is a benefit also for products and services of companies. So this is, this is essential. And with that uh, financial inclusion via technology, the FinTechs, we are seeing in my region, for example, um, um, uh, uh, home workers, uh, domestic workers, uh, they are becoming a part of a platform that provides them with uh, opportunities of work, but also credits. For the first time, these people, they never had access to a bank and now they are having access to, to FinTech, right? So for me, this is critical in order to make sure that if they have uh, independence, economic independence, they're not gonna be victims of violence anymore, you know? So we so have to think about that. Also eliminated the pay gap. It, and as I said, this is critical because it's so frustrating and it's so unjust that we need to continue working on that. And including the supply chain, uh, you know, including the different intersectionalities in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. So gradually you're becoming to, you know, to make entrepreneurs uh, in a much bigger uh, uh, and fast uh, way. So. I think it's in our hands, those opportunities, and we have to focus on that because otherwise with 40 million people that are gonna be unemployed in my region of 660 million people, 
And 40% of my region is going to be in poverty because of the consequence. We are going to become a, a terrible region otherwise. We're going to mm. be, be like South Sahara Africa. So that's why we have to look into the opportunities, to look into, into the, the positive uh, aspects of technology. And the last is continue pushing girls to study STEM. Super. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Maria Noel. Um, I think as, as you know, as, as it's clear, there, there are lots of challenges and lots of opportunities. I think they, they swing into each other nicely. So we've heard about culture, we've heard about leadership, about the importance of mission and purpose. Um, there's some really exciting initiatives you can find out more about, whether it's the ILO Convention, whether it's the Race at Work Charter. Um, there's fascinating work going on with women-owned enterprises that big companies can source from. Um, there's, there's, there's plenty out there. There's the fundamental structural issues around caring economies and around access to finance. Um, so lots of, of, of great ways that we can make progress. So before we, before we, we sort of wrap up, I'd just like to go and ask each of our fantastic um, contributors um, to leave us with a key takeaway. Perhaps it was something that you heard in this session, or perhaps it's something you're going to take away um, and, and do differently moving forward. So can I go first to um, back to David for his key takeaway? So talking about tools and resources, in Carers UK, we have a campaign called Employers for Carers, which now involves several hundred public sector organisations as well as businesses and third sector organisations. And I think one of the very practical things that corporate responsibility coalitions around the world could do is to replicate the kind of model that we have successfully implemented over the last 15 years or so in our Employers for Carers initiative. Lots of very practical tools to help individual Super. employers. take Brilliant. Thank you very much. Zubair. So as the youngest person in this room, I've been like a sponge soaking up all this amazing, amazing experiences and information. Um, I want to paint a little bit of a positive image, um, and I want to talk about the beauty of intersectionality. The fact that these, you know, these intersections exist, these mixed cultures, races, languages, it's beautiful. It's, it's, it's truly what can create incredible solutions in this world. Um, so we should just celebrate the fact that more and more intersections are being created. Fantastic. That's a really nice, nice message. Thank you. Jody. Hey, building on to that, it's the togetherness. Right? When we break down the barriers of, of divisiveness, we can all come together. And um, uh, Zubair, to what you said about building communities can be so powerful to keep progressing along. Super. Um, who am I up to next? Jane. Um, well, I, I think the first thing is it's just fantastic to be having this discussion. Um, and that, you know, it's a discussion about intersectionality and gender discrimination as a, as a business issue that we need to take forward. And I think that's really important. And I suppose my takeaway and something I believe uh, is really important and company strategies can help develop this is how can we enable women stand in their own shoes so that all women in all sectors, in, in all countries, you know, from all backgrounds can have a voice and agency and, and, and you know, build the better. Uh, for the future. Thank you, Jane. Sandra? Um, I think my takeaways, uh, when I think about allyship, it's all, everyone standing up for everyone else, really. You know, those who are not curious, stand up for those who are. Those who are have enterprises, stand up for those who don't. And those who have uh, opportunities, stand up for those who don't. So I think having that across all the intersectionalities, everyone standing up and speaking up, um, we see there's a, a chance to do so. That's what I take away. I think it's really important. All of us in it together. Super. I love that message. And Maria Noel, final words. Well, thank you so much. For me, it's um, the economy of care that we really need to build in order to ensure that women go to work. And let me explain. For me, the economy of care allows women to... Um, make sure that their kids and their ill uh, people that are ill of disability with age etc that those population that they care so much they are well cared we start a new uh, set of labor 
And we also start a new set of economy that will enable women finally to be 50% uh, of the population that are working in the world. Super. I think that's a lovely note to end on. I can't thank you all enough for your time and punctuality. Um, and it's been a pleasure listening to you all today. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.